Welcome to Hackbits, where we cover a variety of cybersecurity subjects. Join your host, Gaspar Martirano, as he interviews cybersecurity experts and discusses the latest cybersecurity news, trends, data breaches, and updates on state-sponsored cybercrime. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hackbits. I'm Gaspar Martirano. I'm going to be today's host. So uh, today's going to be a really uh, interesting topic. It's something that's close to my heart, and uh, I think everyone here um, uh, it, it has served in the military before, and we know what it's like to have the transition out of the military into civilian life and, and some of the challenges that, are reach, uh, that, that can happen. Um, so all of us happen to work in the cybersecurity world, so I think that this is going to be a great conversation talking about um, a bit about the military transition into civilian life and some of the um, uh, jobs that are available for folks that are doing this transition and you know some of the benefits of companies hiring veterans to work for their companies. So what I'll do is just kind of go down the line here and uh, have some uh, everyone introduce themselves, uh, talk a little bit about what they do, who they are, and what branch of service they served in. So Tony, let's start with you. Uh, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm Tony P. Anthony Pilater. I'm the CTO and co-founder for Horizon3.ai. Uh, we're an autonomous penetration testing software as a service. And uh, I, 21 years in the Air Force, and my twilight position was at the as the deputy CTO for the Joint Special Operations Command. Excellent. Happy to be here. Great, Tony. And so I'll jump to you, Monty, because you also work with Tony. So, Monty, why don't you introduce yourself? I do. Thank you very much. My name is Monty Canode. I'm the Director of Customer and Partner Success at Horizon 3 AI, where Tony was a co-founder as the CTO. I uh, My twilight in the career was uh, I was commanding the Air Force's offensive operations from the 6th, uh, 7th Cyber Ops Group and uh, had an absolute blast there. Grew up in special ops, much like Tony did. And uh, it was cool to get to come out of there at uh, such a high level doing what we did. So, uh, Larry, let's go to you. Larry and I work together. We both work for LifeR. So, Larry, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Gasper. Larry Slusser. I'm a threat research analyst and key account manager at LifeR's cybersecurity company. My path was a little different. I transitioned out of the Air Force right at the end of um, 1999. I was an aircraft maintenance and munitions officer. So I found my way into cyber later in life. Um, kind of a kind of an interesting but different path. But aircraft maintenance and any service in the Air Force or any of the other military is a great fit in cybersecurity, in my opinion. And now let's jump to CJ. CJ is the, uh, the only one from the group that's not in the Air Force or hasn't been in the Air Force and is transitioning out of the Navy. So CJ, tell us a little bit about your journey and where, where you are today. That's right. I'll, I'll call it my uh, twilight to tour as the junior of the group, but that twilight was you know about a week ago. Uh, so I worked uh, Navy and then uh, the threat intel analyst side. And most recently, I was working with uh, NCIS, or so the cyber and law enforcement uh, merging together, which was uh, a lot of fun. Excellent. And, and I'm Gaspar Martorano. I did a brief stint in the Air Force. I actually was injured, uh, was discharged. Later on, I uh, worked with the Coast Guard. Um, and now I, uh, part time I am, uh, I do work with the Coast Guard at the Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, uh, working with their law enforcement, usually on, uh, some investigations help that they need. So I, that's my, my side gig that I like to, uh, like to dedicate my time to when I'm not, not playing with my kids. Well, I shouldn't say play anymore. They're much older now. So they, they just watch their football, his, uh, football game. So I'm glad to have everyone here. This should be a great conversation. Uh, I appreciate all your service. Um, you know, before we get into the actual other 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 um, items I have on my list, I think I'd be remiss if we didn't like just take a moment to talk about um, you know Afghanistan and wh what's happened in in in, in the coming uh, the past few weeks, uh, and you know, kind of take a moment to kind of you know think about kind of the service members that lost their lives, uh, and I know all of you serve, so I know you, you feel just as much as I do. Um, you know, a, a debt of gratitude is owed, obviously, to their families and and kind of their their sacrifice and what they've done. The service to this nation. So I always want to um, just take a moment to think about that. And I know, I don't know if you, you probably all know someone uh, that served overseas and, and, and gone through that. And CJ, especially you're still in the service. So I'm assuming that you, you've known people as well. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. I just thought I'd be, you know, kind of remiss if I didn't bring up, um, you know, kind of their sacrifice. And I, I really appreciate everything that, you know, everyone does and they sacrifice uh, every day. Yeah, it's, uh, my, I had teammates that were there. Uh, you know, I was there several times. I have teammates who were there on the ground as they were pulling folks out. Um, uh, a lot of the folks, more than a third of my 
company is from the special operations world um, and have served either in Afghanistan or around Afghanistan in support of that. My entire career, all but one year, was in support of that war. And it was kind of a abrupt and strange end. And it affected, uh, you know, affected me. It affected my wife. She was also part of the Special Operations Command as well as uh, supporting the mission downrange there. Um, so, yeah, just a strange time, strange last couple of weeks, how it all, all that time, all that effort, and then all of a sudden that – they're just going to take it right back. It was, it's, it's been crazy. Yeah, it has. And, uh, and like I said, it's, um, it's something that it's, it's been on my mind and I'm sure anyone that's served, uh, you know, it's, it's been heavy in their, in their minds as well. But, you know, so today we're going to talk a bit about the journey, right. From the military life into civilian life. So, uh, why don't we start off with, um, with Monty, what, what, what was your journey like uh, when you transitioned out of the military into the civilian world? Did you get right into cybersecurity or did you have, you know, did you kind of bounce around a bit or did you work, you know, what, what did you do right after it, right after you were discharged? So it's interesting when I, I've been doing cybersecurity most of I, all, most of my career, although I grew up in special operations, I've been doing this kind of defensive and offensive operations now for about the last uh, maybe 11 to 12 years. And uh, when I get transitioned out, it was right in the middle of COVID. And so I came out last summer. I've been uh, uh, with Horizon 3 now for about a year, was messaging with uh, Tony and Snehal for about three to four months before I departed. And so I was already in that, but it was during COVID. And so we were in uh, trying to figure out how in the military, we have what we call combat effective. We were trying to fill a, figure out how can we be combat effective from home and on my side of the world where you're working in a classified environment, classified spaces all the time, it made it weird to try and figure out how to do that. And so we were trying to figure out how could we go into these spaces and still do the things we do. And uh, so that was a little weird there coming into this side and doing it into a work from home environment. I'd already been prepped up for it a little bit. So it wasn't too bad. That, that transition was maybe a little easier for right. me than it was for others. Right. And Tony, what was it like for you? I, I know you served 21 years. So what? How, how was that journey? What did it look like? I cheated. I'm a hacker. Yeah. That's what I do. I cheat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, everybody, was, everybody gets worried. They're like, oh, there is so much of this unknown about what am I going to do when I get out? There, I have all these things that I just don't know about. I was like, ah, I don't know what I'm going to do. And then Snehal and I started talking about this doing this thing at horizon 3.ai and i cheated so i created my own executive position right months, right <laughs> 15 months ago i was a master sergeant in the united states air force now i'm the cto of a you know 50 million dollar company it's it's it was it was crazy yeah, I would I love say that. that that's possible anybody can do that if i can do it anybody can do it to be quite honest you know, it's funny you say that, Tony. Like, I uh, I used to have friends that would say, oh, I have this great job. And, one, oh, no, what if I lose my job? I said, well, look, if you lose your job, you can always make your own job, right? If you have, uh, you know, the will, you can create your own work uh, if you if you have kind of a, a plan going forward. So uh, I really kind of appreciate what you did, and I think it's fantastic. So, Larry, you said you, you did it later, later on in life, right? So when did you actually transition into, you, know, you decided you were going to get your master's in cybersecurity, and then what? how did that kind of go down? So that's actually a great question. I decided um, after a career in leadership in corporate America, a couple of Fortune 500 companies, that I wanted to take my career in a different different way. And I was interested in cybersecurity. So I sought counsel from some friends who advised me not to do that. I was at a U2 concert and ran into Brian Denman, who was my best friend in Air Force ROTC, was a colonel at the time. Come to find out, he actually worked with Monty, which is just a really small world. And he said, go for it. You'll love it. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's it's different from the military, but similar, and it's a great mission, and you'll love it. So I went and got my master's degree. Uh, within two months of graduation, I found LifeRs, and it's been exactly what he described. I enjoy work every day. It's hectic and busy, but I feel like we're actually making a difference in the world, which is one of the reasons I joined the Air Force. That's, that's great. Uh, so CJ, you're, you're transitioning out and you're, you, you're uh, MOS, you're in cyber right now. So I'm assuming for you, it's a very natural transition, obviously, to go from, uh, you know, your job is not really changing, uh, but, but it is going to be a different world you're living in than dealing with, um, than dealing with uh, civilians. So what, is, what, are your, what are your plans and how, how has the journey been going and how has the 
job search been going so far? Sure. And it's sort of the, uh, it, it's sort of funny because I, Monty was saying that the pre-COVID, entering that right as COVID was happening, it's almost as if I was hitting the post-COVID, obviously we're still in this whole, you know, awful situation, but the job situation has changed dramatically. Ma- reason I left the Navy was to be in one spot. And so just moving by family in Springfield. And so when I started looking at it two years ago, I thought I was going to be limited by that location. And there are only so many places nearby there. And uh, now with so many remote opportunities and so many places that are accessible, it really makes it uh, kind of the world's your oyster in terms of what's available. And so that's been pretty great. I came into the cyber side as a pure Intel uh, person. And then after about two years, I kept being assigned as the cybersecurity guy. So I had a similar situation with Larry. Where I said, I need to know more about this if people are going to tell me I'm the guy. And so that's uh, that's where I did some more education. And you know, my recent work has been doing that. So it's been a fun ride. So Tony, do you think that uh, employers have a good understanding of what what the benefits are of hiring a vet? Um, you know, I think before we started recording, you and I were talking and, and I told you how I worked at this place where they didn't outright say it, but, um, and it's not my current company, obviously, but, but I worked at a company where they really shied away from when a veteran, um, veterans, uh, resume came, came in front of us. I, you know, or especially if someone was in a national guard or if they were, you know, our reserves, they would sort of shy away from it saying, well, oh, what if they get called to service or what if, um, you know, they have to go away for two weeks every year and every other week. You know, they kind of didn't like the fact um, that they, they they might not have their full attention or or there was something about it. That I always felt they had a negative inference, which I never understood. So, Tony, tell me, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think employers really understand the benefits of hiring someone that served in the military? Not all of them. No, there, it has been my mission to bring that awareness of what it is that folks are missing by not having veterans on their team um, out to the Valley. Silicon Valley has, you know, they're, they kind of struggle with that. They, they're not exposed to it as much. And there is, there are these connotations that come with military service, like the the movies and Arlie Ermey and all, you know, all of those approaches and and what the, the military is represented as in the, in the, in the movies. And it's totally not the case. The, if you think about the amount of responsibility that is placed on a young service member at a very young age, um, is the the responsibility, the 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 things that are at stake, the amount of pressure that is put on them, the amount of deliberate leadership, which I think is missing in a lot of organizations. We get deliberate leadership uh, and and deliberate mentorship in the service that a lot of companies don't, don't do. So any service member who leaves, no matter where they're leaving at either four years or 34 years, they have experiences and, um, uh, and training and understanding and competencies that people just won't be able to catch up with. And, and they should be hiring more veterans. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent that, you know, those leadership skills that are learned when you're, when you're serving are just, you know, you don't find that anywhere else. And, um, you know, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Gunny. I would love to have Gunny like running a tech department. I can imagine running it'd be pretty, pretty interesting to watch that. Yeah, yeah. uh, You know, I met him a few years ago at a show. I was with my son and he was the nicest man you'd ever, I mean, he just, it was, he was a sweetheart and it's not what I expected. (laughs) You watch Full Metal Jacket and I expected him to kind of yell at me, but no, he was just a, just a really, really great person. Um, So, so Monty, any thoughts on that? I mean, what are your feelings about just employers and, and, and kind of what uh, vets have to offer? Do you think that they just don't have a full grasp on it and, and what can be done, you think, by by you know by us? I think by people that served, um, you know, should be doing more to try and get them to understand the benefits of hiring someone that has served in the military before. You know, I think it's a it's a great question. And uh, while we talk about the companies and them understanding the military person, I'm going to tell you, I don't even think the military people understand the benefits they bring themselves. Uh, Tony and Larry and I were probably surrounded by people and CJ 
who were like, well, what, why would I go work for a, a Silicon Valley startup? I, they're not going to want me. I've been doing, and you almost default into this way of thinking that you're going to go into a civilian sector, a civilian kind of job, and just keep doing what you're doing. And for a lot of military, I think there's a comfort and a security factor there. But they also, a lot of us don't understand the incredible skills and background and experience that we bring to a job uh, out in the private sector. And I think that's something that we can also do is help educate our military brothers and sisters on, man, you have got some incredible capabilities you bring to the fight that companies are dying for, you know? Yeah, that that's a great point. So CJ, what do you say about that? I mean, so th- did you have the confidence? I know you and I met on on Veterati, which we'll, t- we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, but you know, do you have the confidence going out there saying, yeah, you know what, um, you know, they should be, they're lucky to have me. <laughs> you know, that, I almost feel like that should be the attitude, right? I mean, how do you, how did you feel? Did, did, it, were you, did you have some hesitation or did you feel pretty confident that you're going to get out there and that, you know, you're going to have offers flying your way? So it's a, a yes and no, uh, I, I think on my, on my end that, I, that I've seen that the yes comes from the fact that there's definitely interest. Any initial conversation is always filled with excitement about it. And I think the no, and that kind of speaks to what Monty was saying of the military, not knowing how, you know, what we offer, it's the translation of the skills in those, especially the soft skills that deliver it, leadership or those, you know, things, you know, hitting timelines, all of that gets much more challenging to convey. And what I found really helpful wasn't, you know, there's an overwhelming amount of resources for veterans, which I'm incredibly grateful for, but really the value comes from those, individual mentoring people who have done it and then can talk to your specific situation. So once I found people that could do that, that really gave me the confidence to like, oh, okay, this is, you know, this is very doable and, you know, it's still stressful, obviously, but it's, you know, like a very achievable level of stress. Yeah. And it, uh, you saying that Larry said something interesting I picked up on before. Larry, you n- mentioned how you thought there was a slim similarities between uh, military service and the type of work that's done and the world of cybersecurity and the work that's done. So I kind of like to get your perspective. Where do you see kind of the similarities between, um, you know, between the two um, and why maybe that's why people that have served fit so well into that into that uh, that bucket? So I think it's probably fair to say that all of us who served in the military did not do it for the money. Um, we did it from a desire to make a difference for our friends, our families, and our country. And I think I see elements of that weaving uh, throughout cybersecurity. Um, certainly the money is different, but the <clears throat> excitement of locating a threat actor on somebody's system, the the essentially a battle, cyber battle that ensues, the defense, the offense, it's it's very similar. And the ability to make decisions, um, I think, is really key. And I don't think it matters what rank you are when you get out of the military, you have had training, real-world training on making decisions, processing information, and not being afraid to get things done. And I see that as directly transferable. I've been lucky enough in my career to work for companies that appreciated the military, and that was valued. Um so I've, I've been lucky that way. I wish wish all companies were. Yeah, it's a great point. Um, so, you know, I, it is cyber war, right? So it is warfare. So when you think about it, it's like we're being attacked constantly from different directions, different angles, um, and it's 24 hours a day. So it is fighting, uh, fighting a battle. So, uh, Tony, any thoughts on that? What do you think about kind of the similarities between, you know, military service and, 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 and working and uh, and and, and what happens in the cyber world and kind of being under attack all the time, you know, companies, yeah. businesses, and the U.S. as an infrastructure in general. I th- honestly, I think it goes beyond just cyber. I mean, you look at intelligence, and I have uh, an intelligence guy who works for me now, uh, Carlos, who is an amazing dude. He, he was a, a CW5 in the Army doing intelligence, and... It was, and I've talked to several other intelligence analysts who are like, oh, I'm not sure how I translate into the private sector, so I'm going to go right back to the, you know, the the big companies, the defense industrial base, and I'm like, well, you replace find bad guy with find sales opportunities, find uh, new new revenue channels, and if you translate the things that we learned in the service based on the mission that we had. It, it, there are plenty of translations 
into what what's going on in the private sector. But as far as cyber goes, yes, it is, we are constantly under attack. We are in constant defense mode. It's the same sort of we have to get it right 100% of the time and the bad guys only got to get it right 1% or one time period. And that same mindset of of what we what we were what we went through in the service it, it translates completely. Yes, agree. You know what's really interesting is that I don't think the general public really understands like they'll watch the nightly news and maybe see, you know, a big uh breach happened and they'll they'll kind of get it a little bit, but all of us that work in this industry really understand that this happens every day, 24 hours a day uh, at some level, uh, you know, big breaches, small breaches, medium breaches. So things are happening from all sorts of people, uh, state sponsored threat actors to, you know, you know, the, the guy sitting in his basement, you know, we always say, right. So it's happening all the time. And I think it's a constant, it's a constant battle that's happening. And I think that's what drives, um, you know, my, my, my feeling is that it drives people to kind of be involved in, in, in the war. And, and this is a way it's just a different type of warfare. Monty, any, any, any thoughts, anything you want to add to kind of that, that thought? Yeah, I think some of the same questions that are being asked of uh, the C-suite and some of the others, you know, are we secure? And they're asking this to cyber people when the wrong question, uh, that's like asking somebody, is America secure? And the bottom line is, is you're doing as much as you can for your country. But the better question is, are we ready? Are we prepared? And that same kind of mentality that we do in the military, one of the things I love doing uh, was uh, different exercises. And you would have op four, which were some of your own, who would be that red team that would come at you and you would exercise against them. And it didn't matter what which service you're in, but there was always the, you were using some of your own as an op four to prepare for what might happen. And I think that's something that uh, we can carry in as military people into a company is that mentality on being prepared being ready and what are the steps we need to do to get prepared and ready for should something happen because uh it's gonna yeah it's 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 not uh it's it's, it's not if it's when right so it's going to happen um 100 cj, CJ do you have anything to kind of add to the thought uh not really uh, that seems pretty pretty on point for what we you know that's that's the goal we're trying to defend to really i like the the point of having cybersecurity as a service, you know, that's something that definitely translates in my mind and something that gets me excited about risk. If that's uh, if that's possible. Sure. Well, here's something I, 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 I didn't write this question, but it just came to mind. So, and I'll go through everyone. Uh, did you have like a, a technical background at all? Like I know myself, I got my first computer when I was 12 years old. My parents bought me this thing called the Timex Sinclair 1000. And I remember sitting, like, trying to hack into things, you know, I was a young kid using a modem, uh, and then war games came out and I got all excited, you know, thinking I could start a nuclear war uh, from my basement. But um, did you always have like, uh, did you did you have it in you? Did you mess with computers or did it just kind of happen later on in life? Like even just the thought process of like, wow, look at what a machine can do. Uh, was it always with you, Tony? Did you, what, What's your background? Like when's the first time you actually even understood the word of cyber? I mean, I used, you know, AOL. And before that, I had another one. Uh, I think it was called a quantum link that was on my Commodore 64. So I was online pre internet. Uh, and I don't know you guys are probably younger than me. So Tony, what was your, uh, what was your, what was it like for you? Yeah, I had me, a, I had a Commodore. I was uh, building flight simulator programs. I can't remember the name of the, there was another smaller computer that you had the, you had to use DAT and I saved all the programs to a, a, a Cassette, tape. cassette tape yeah yeah was yeah, right doing that stuff all through high school or all through school i was messing with computers just the power of logic really really excited me really excited me so a lot of hacking when i say hacking using things in ways that they weren't supposed to be used right right for myself um aol there was a uh, net zero i used a lot of net zero yeah, <laughs> weird things on net zero. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, uh, and then all through all through high school, I was the computer guy. So. Yeah, 
How about you, Monty? Were you always kind of into it? Did you did you have a machine early on in life, or when, when did you start messing around with the system? No, and I had the Vic twenty, and even nice. like I grew up with the Apple two E and two C, and but I was learning how to draw Van Halen stickers on those things with uh, draw just connecting lines and learning how to connect pixels. My business was always in infrastructure. I, uh -huh. I didn't know how to do system code, but like network queuing structures and and understanding how to make uh, the networks go faster. That was that was what I loved was understanding that flow and digging into that. That's where I had my jam, and that was always fun. How about you, Larry? What was your uh, what was your experience with computers, just in general? Yeah, so I might be a little older guy of the group. Um, we had a IBM PC3, I think, with the little green uh, green monochrome, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Commodore 64. Always kind of interested in that, never really dove in. The Air Force challenged me going to Dash 1 school, being an aircraft maintenance officer, getting in the TOs. Liked that, then kind of got away from it into leadership. Um, but I missed the tech, and when I started down the cybersecurity master's path. Um, the program I chose actually had a, a decent amount of lab time and tech time, and and I liked it. And I think that's a key is you kind of have to have a desire for that and enjoy the technical side, maybe not to get all the certs but um, or certifications, but you definitely want to be able to get into the detail. How about you, CJ? I, I think you might be the youngest of the group, so you're probably going to say, yeah, I got my first machine you know, three years ago. But tell me, what was it like for you? Uh, when did you start kind of tinkering around? Was it something you always loved when you were younger or how did, how did it, how did it work out for you? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think I'm the younger of the group. I, I, I can remember floppy disks, but that's, that's about it. And then it's really windows XP and then, and, and beyond. Uh, I, I was not a tech, I was not, I was fine with tech and could do it, but not, uh, very, you know, into it uniquely in college. I was in middle East studies and philosophy. Like that's what I did, and I, I love the language side, and that's really the the first thing that I realized when I started looking more on the technical side is how much of linguistic carryover there is with programming languages and develop, and how networks are so human. I always thought it was going to be the same process everywhere, but it's very much not. Everyone has their own quirks or their organization, and I've I've always loved that, and that's really you know gotten me interested in just trying to delve in and learn those languages and you know, how, how that all functions. Yeah. Tony, do you have something to add? Yeah. I, I saw we were coming close on time, so I didn't want to jump in, but what I find super interesting about cybersecurity and technology in general is, and when I have calls on Veterati, I, I try and explain this. Um, it's a little bit longer, but I'll try and keep it short. Everything is built. It started with voltage, no voltage, Right. And then it went into ones and zeros. And then from there, it's been nothing more than continuous adding of layers of abstraction on top of it to make it easier to use or to easier to, uh, to program on top of. And the lower in the stack you can understand, the better, the easier it is for you to understand new technologies as they come out because they're nothing more than just additional layers of abstraction. Containers and virtualization is nothing more than an abstraction on top of kernels and hardware architecture, right? And from an attacker standpoint and a cybersecurity standpoint, both offense and defense, understanding things at a much lower layer in that stack allows you to be significantly more uh, successful in staying up to date, understanding how to how these protocols and all these things work together. Uh, I, I find that really interesting. And I try and tell people as they're getting into it, that, you know, you're transitioning out. How, where do I start? Where, I want to get into cyber. I want to get into tech. Where do I start? I try and say, start lower in the stack and understand uh, more of the fundamentals of what's going on underneath. And you'll, you'll, you'll skyrocket from there. I just wanted to throw that out there. No, that's great. It was so eloquent. I wish I was ending it on that note, but but I do have one more question. So um, just some, some last thoughts for, you know, if you are transitioning out of the military, uh, what are some of the tools they could, they could use to really get out there and network? I know that's, again, another challenge is, is how do you build that network? Um, you know, I tell folks, uh, you know, what we can talk about it here as well, that, hey, find me on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. My network is your network. I, I'm here to really serve and help uh, anyone that's 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 served in the military, and I want to make sure that I do everything I possibly can to help them enter the civilian world. And you know, and I always my I have my only caveat is if you make a few million dollars, maybe you buy me dinner one day. So, uh, 
Tony, any any tips real quick, closing out, just uh, some some tips, and I'll go down the line of maybe some of the things that can be done to help facilitate um, you know that transition. Yeah, I will tell you that we have an amazing network of people uh, throughout the service uh, who have gotten out and are, and are who just want to help. Uh, I find a lot of satisfaction out of linking, giving folks access to the network that I have amassed, uh, and and getting people jobs, uh, finding people who find people who find people these people jobs. We have an amazing group of folks that have transitioned out of the service who really just want to help. You got Kirk Windemuller, Herb Thomas, uh, Thompson, uh, myself, uh, Stephen Mills. LinkedIn is a huge, huge thing. Veterati is awesome. American Corporate Partners, CodeBuddies.org. Uh, there's, there's lots of them. Hit me up. I got a whole list of things that I'd love to just help people uh, find what they need in life as they transition out of the service. That's great. Monty, anything uh, you want to add to that? He just listed, I think, everything. <laughs> I was going to say, man, that's uh, that's Tony, dude. He leaves you uh, just uh, your mouth hanging open like, holy crap, he just said that. So uh, I would just tell you, make sure you use the uh, programs that are there. TAP and some of those are good programs in there. And there are uh, a lot of BSOs that are available. I'll tell you, one of the things our company utilizes and as a commander, I authorized people to go do with SkillBridge. And DoD SkillBridge is where you get a chance to uh, take, some, take some of that time and work with a private industry company that has signed off for you to come there. And the DoD com- continues to pay you at whatever your current rank is, but you're developing some experience. It's kind of like an internship where you get to go see how it is working in private industry and they and you get to learn about it highly encourage not just the people who are doing it but commanders let them go do it i realize that it's a hit on your books but you gotta 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 let people go do this so that they can develop that experience and that yeah because one of these days you're going to be doing it too that's great so uh look i appreciate everyone coming on uh today so uh again i'm gaspar martirano uh our website is www.lifars.com Com. That's L I F A R S dot com. Uh, Tony, why don't you give out the website to your company? Yep, we're Horizon Three dot AI. H O R I Z O N Three dot AI. God, I hope I spelled that right. Yeah, I know. I, I, I had to think about it too. I'm like, you don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Listen to it later on the playback and go, whoops. Uh, but uh, no, I appreciate. It. I think you got it right, uh, Larry. Thanks so much. You know, I always thank you for your service. Larry works with me here at Life Hours. Uh, I, I really enjoy working with you and it's always fantastic to, to get together and CJ, man, uh, I wish you the best of luck. I know wherever you end up, hopefully you end up with us or maybe someone else. Um, but I wish you the best of luck out there. And I'd like to do this again. Maybe we'll, we'll get together another time if you guys are open to it and, uh, have, uh, maybe a deeper discussion on some, some topics, but it's up to you guys. I'd love to do it again in the future. I'm totally down for that. I love this. Yeah, sure. Too easy. Great. Thank you, everyone. And I appreciate your time today. And uh, this is Hackbits. Take care.